dough isn't difficult and is the basis of great pizza. We've put together a masterclass, no matter your skill level. From super simple, no need classic dough, right through to sourdough and bigger. Finishing off with a few top tips on balling and hand stretching. Lots of people talk about hydration. This is simply the percentage of water to flour, so don't feel too phased by this. Uni ambassador Lewis Pope of Unholy Pizza explains all. So what is hydration? Um, in the simplest of terms, water. Um, and it's the amount of water that's going into your dough recipe. It's usually referred to as a percentage. If you've got 1,000 grams of flour and 600 grams of water, that's considered as 60% of hydration. So the lesser amount of water, so a low hydration, although it would be a lot easier to handle and work with, could give you a much drier, more dense crust. Whereas the higher amount of water, the higher hydration that you put into the dough, the end result could give you a much nicer, lighter, airy crust. 60% is, as you can see, that the dough itself is quite firm. Um, it's not sticky whatsoever, so you, or you will find that this will be so much easier to ball up. 65%, it will be still relatively easy to ball up. It's more tackier than the 60%. With high hydration, it will require quite a lot of practice. So you can see that it's a lot stretchier, a lot stickier. You have to be very quick. So you'll find as well with high hydration, after it's been balled up, it will tend to relax even more. And I'm gonna put these in a tray and then we'll see the, the differences and how they've reacted after they've been resting over a period of time. So we've got 60%, 65% and 70%. For the 60%, for the less amount of water, the dough itself is not sticky at all. The 65%, um, a little bit tacky in comparison, uh, but it still held its shape quite well. And 70%, you can see that it's much stickier to the touch. Okay, so because it's 60% hydration, it does feel like it needs just that little bit more work. So I'm just gonna do very simple tomato base with some grano padano. Now we're gonna do the 65% hydration. Feels a lot lighter just to press that air into the crusts. Much easier to stretch out. Okay, so this is the 70%, much lighter. But the thing with high hydration is you just need to be more gentle. Just take your time with it. This is the 60% hydration. So it just looks a little bit more dense. And this is the 65. Feels a little bit lighter, much softer. And then we have the 70%, which is really soft, very light. So if you want to play around with different levels of hydration in your dough, first tip will be not every flour can handle high amounts of water. So if you do want to play around with it, my tip will be is start low and work your way up until you find a consistency that you're confident and happy with. Sourdough is simple once you get the hang of it. It is also super digestible with a tangy taste and amazing texture. Artisan Brian shows you how to make your own. All right, guys, so although I'm a baker, um, honestly, anyone can make sourdough at home. It's a super simple process. So the goal today is to show you my tried and tested, super simple and delicious method for making sourdough pizza. So you might be wondering, what is sourdough? All right, guys, sourdough is just a way to naturally ferment your dough. And it starts by adding some sourdough starter into your dough as opposed to using fresh yeast or instant yeast. And when you do this, you're gonna allow your dough to ferment for a longer period of time, thus giving you a more easily digestible end product 
and a more delicious pizza. So look, I love all kinds of different types of pizzas. I like Roman style, Sicilian style, Detroit style, but guys, today I'm gonna show you my Neapolitan style pizza. It's the preferred dough that I like to make when I'm using the uni oven. So although Neapolitan pizza is traditionally made with white flour or zero zero flour, I typically use a blend of whole grain flour with zero zero or bread flour. And the reason I add whole grain flour into my dough mix is because I always like to include more nutrition into my mixes. Even if it's croissant dough or baguette dough, specifically with pizza dough, I love to make sure I'm getting that added of uh, easy digestion, nutrition, and flavor. So the reason I love to use Zero Zero Flour is because it gives you a great structure, bite, and chew, and an awesome product. But don't worry if you can't find Zero Zero Flour. You can totally use bread flour to get a fantastic result and a great pizza. All right, guys, so the most important part of making delicious sourdough pizza and something you'll have to get used to is maintaining your sourdough starter. Uh, by maintaining your sourdough starter, I mean you need to feed it regularly. And feeding is basically just adding equal parts of flour and water um, along with your mature starter or your mother starter and mixing it together. You leave it at room temperature on the kitchen countertop, it's perfectly fine, covered, and you can feed it once or twice a day to make sure that it's nice and active for when you're ready to mix your dough. So you have your mature sourdough starter and now you are all set to make delicious sourdough pizza. If you're confused, don't be, because it's very simple to get from this mature sourdough starter into your final mix. You're just going to have your mature starter, you're going to feed it so that you get a leaven, okay? And then you take your leaven and you add it into your bowl for your final mix. So now that you're ready to make your dough, here's what you're gonna need. For the leaven mix, you'll need 50 grams of mature sourdough starter, 50 grams of zero zero flour or bread flour, 50 grams of whole grain flour, and 100 grams of warm water. For the final dough mix, you'll need 425 grams of zero zero flour or bread flour, 75 grams of whole grain flour, 310 grams of warm water, 10 grams of salt, and 200 grams of your leaven mix. Let's get started. So now we're ready to make our leaven mix. Here I've got 50 grams of mature sourdough starter, and we're gonna add 50 grams of whole grain flour into the jar. as well as 50 grams of zero zero flour, or if you're using bread flour, you would add 50 grams of bread flour. Beautiful. To finish it off, we'll add our 100 grams of warm water. Okay. Now we'll use a fork to incorporate all of the ingredients together and just make sure that there's no dry flour left. We'll leave this covered and we're gonna wanna let this sit for three to four hours. I cover it with either the lid for the jar or a kitchen cloth is fine. My kitchen is usually 72 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit or 22 to 23 Celsius and it should double in size in about four hours. And one of the tips I like to kind of give people, a lot of bakers do this as well, is that we'll you know put a little rubber band here it's a good visual cue for you to kind of see noticeable growth in your leaven build. So if you come back in three to four hours and it's kind of just above that rubber band, you can let it keep pushing. Maybe your kitchen's a little bit colder today. Uh, and if your kitchen's really warm, you might see in two hours that it's all the way at the top already. So that rubber band will kind of help you uh, visually be able to look over in your kitchen and kind of gauge whether or not it's time to start that final mix. All right, awesome. So we've got our leaven here that's ready to go and we're ready to start our final mix. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to dissolve the salt into the water in a large bowl. I'm just use my hands here to get that incorporated. Great, and the next step is going to be to add our leaven into this bowl and do the same thing to make sure it's dissolved. I just use my hands to kind of guide it out, dissolve, with your fingers. And now we're ready to move on and add our flour. So I start by adding 425 grams of zero zero flour or bread flour if that's what you're using. And then we add our 75 grams of whole grain flour. Now what we'll do is we'll mix using our hands. So what I'm trying to do right now by mixing is ensure that there's no dry flour left and all of the water gets incorporated so that we start developing strength in our dough. 
Once all of that is incorporated, we're gonna let it rest for 10 minutes um, so that we can continue to build some strength. Um, specifically because I add whole grain flour, um, I like to give it this rest period. Uh, so the water fully bonds with the gluten and we have a strong dough before we start kneading. So now that our mixture has rested for 10 minutes, what we're gonna look for is a nice bit of elasticity in the dough to check that we've started to build some strength. But just remember that you will see a little bit of tearing since we haven't done the kneading process yet. So what we're gonna do is dust our work surface, turn the dough out, and we're gonna begin kneading by hand. I like to knead by hand because I'm a very hands-on baker and I like to connect with my dough anytime I'm making dough. But you can also use a stand mixer. We're gonna turn our dough out. So like I said, we're looking for that nice smooth elasticity. And to begin our kneading process, I actually like to kind of just get my hands a little bit of flour. And I take the top of the dough and I push it into the middle. And then with the palm of my hands, I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually let the dough rip a little bit as I need. Let it rip and build back together. I also like to turn the dough. I rotate it a little bit. So I get consistent kneading on all sides of the dough. If you think about um, professional pizzaiolo, they mix their dough with spiral mixers. And what a spiral mixer does is essentially what I'm doing. Um, it, it kind of rotates the dough while pushing the dough into itself in a gentle way. You can kind of speed up as you move along, as your dough starts to develop. Just remember to use your palm to push and your fingers to pull it back into itself. Don't be afraid to add more flour if it starts to get a little bit sticky. You can use one or two hands at any time. Once you're kind of, you know you're kind of halfway there when you know you, you push a little bit and you can see the dough start to just come back into itself. You know that your dough is developing strength um, and it's starting to resist. When it's starting to resist, <clears throat> you'll be at the point, you're almost at the point where you're gonna wanna stop and start your fermentation because it means that your gluten strands are pretty strong and you're actually now doing more harm than good. So once you see a little bit of resistance, you know you're kind of almost at that point. So you can keep kneading. And then once you see that smooth surface and a lot of resistance, you'll be able to know it's time to stop kneading. So I'm gonna keep going for a little bit more. I think this dough can take a little bit more kneading. Kneading, mixing, dough hook, spiral, hands, stretch and fold. Any, you know, when you do these things to dough, you're just trying to strengthen it, yeah. So we can see now, every time I push, we see that nice contraction of the dough. We see that nice movement that it's doing by itself. And so when I see that consistently, and I know that the surface is smooth, it's not sticking to the table, I know that this dough is done being kneaded. I'll take the smoother surface and I'll make that the top of my dough. And I'll kind of use my fingers to tuck the bottom part into itself. First of all, I like to maintain that there's a smooth surface, always a smooth surface. I don't like tears or jagged edges in my surface. Um, and that, I believe, helps the fermentation happen evenly. So you want to tighten up your dough. Into a ball is fine. Uh, it doesn't really matter the shape, but I always find that a ball gives you the tightest structure. It's all about structure and it's all about creating the perfect environment for fermentation in the dough. So nice and tight so that your gluten strands are compact for now and they have a nice even environment to start expanding as it enters the fermentation stage. Um, and another thing you can do is you can check the structure of your gluten by performing what's called the window pane test. And what you can do there, you will, you know, just be careful to not tear any of your dough, but you kind of just want to open up some of the dough and make sure that you can kind of see through it a little bit without tearing it. You don't need to really obsess or go crazy with that. You don't want to start, you don't want to start butchering your dough. If you pull at your dough and you get some instant tearing, you can continue to knead your dough. Um, and just also remember, we don't want to overwork our dough at any time. We always want to give it good periods of rest. So if I did want to continue kneading this dough at this point, I would let this rest another five, 10 minutes to let all of the gluten strands kind of relax 
and then I would start building them back up again. So now that we know that we're done with our kneading process, we've done our window pane test, we're confident with our gluten development, and we like the way our dough feels, we're going to enter our stage of bulk fermentation. And so what I like to do for this, the first fermentation of my dough is I like to take a container, I like to add a little bit of oil so that it doesn't stick to the container. Spread it around the bottom and a little bit on the sides because our dough is going to expand and it will make contact with all sides of your container. Okay, and then we take our dough, we keep the same bottom part, the seam on the bottom, we'll keep that on the bottom in our container. And then we will close our container. And to enter our bulk fermentation stage, we're going to leave this on our countertop uh, for about three hours. The reason I prefer bulk fermentation is because it's a good option to kickstart the fermentation process and have a nice strong dough before dividing it into pizza dough balls later on. So now that we've finished kneading and our dough is entering bulk fermentation, we can notice a few things about it that it's still round, it hasn't quite expanded, obviously it just started, it doesn't touch all of the corners. Meanwhile, I've got a dough that is finished its stage of bulk fermentation, and you can notice a lot of differences here. Uh, our dough has expanded quite a bit, not just um, upwards, but it's expanded towards all the corners. It's touching all of the sides, uh, which is why we like to oil the container on the sides as well. And we can also notice a difference in the texture of the dough on the sides. We can see pockets of air that have been building up. And, and that's obviously part of that fermentation process. The gases and air bubbles start to form and it kind of pushes our dough upwards. So again, this dough is just finished kneading. That, the gluten development, they're nice and strong, but now they need a chance to re rest for a long time, develop those bubbles and develop this smooth surface. Um, actually, you can see the surface here. I can touch it. It's a little bit bouncy. It's not too sticky. So we maintain that smooth surface that we were looking for when we needed it. Um, we don't have any tears or any, any holes in the top. Uh, and it's nice and pliable. Very, very nice. Very, very nice dough, actually. Biga is a process favored by Italians and is a type of pre-ferment. Julian Guy of Pizza is Lovely is a fan of this method and provides a step-by-step -step tutorial. To make the Biga, you need one kilo of high protein zero or zero zero pizza flour, 540 grams of water, and four grams of fresh yeast. Whisk the yeast into your jug of water and make sure it's fully dissolved. Next, place the flour in a large mixing bowl and pour the wet ingredients on top. With a metal spoon, roughly mix the ingredients together. Then use your hands to firmly squeeze and grip the dough, pulling and tearing until all the flour is combined. Transfer the mix to an airtight container, scraping down the sides of the bowl with your hands. Feel the dough for consistency. You should be left with dryish, scraggy clumps. Cover and leave to ferment for 16 hours at room temperature. Now for the dough. Weigh out 80 grams of iced water, 100 grams of room temperature water, 22 grams of fine sea salt, and 22 grams of diastatic malt powder. Open your airtight container. You'll notice the Biga has developed a complex structure and has become soft and slightly stretchy. With the spiral dough hook fitted, transfer the beaker to your mixer and start mixing on a low speed. Although I recommend using a spiral mixer, you can use a stand mixer with a dough hook attachment. As this is a high hydration dough, I wouldn't recommend hand mixing. Slowly drip the salted water in, stopping each time the bottom of the mixer bowl looks wet. This will take about 5-10 to 10 minutes as the flour absorbs the water. With the mixer still running, slowly sprinkle the diastatic malt into the dough. The malt adds a nice additional flavour, but more importantly provides the yeast with a new food source, resulting in lighter, more aerated dough. You can skip this step if you're unable to source the malt. Slowly drip the 80 grams of iced water. You'll need to judge how much water to use depending on your flour and the hydration that you want. Adding 10 grams of the water will give you 65% hydration, whereas adding 80 grams will create 72% hydration. Stop adding water when your dough turns silky and stretchy and continue to mix for a further five minutes. 
Fill a bowl with water, wet your hands and gently pull and gather the dough from the bowl. Transfer it to the airtight container and leave it to rest for two hours at room temperature. After two hours, place the container in the fridge for a further two hours. Remove from the fridge, wet your hands and transfer the dough to the work surface. You should find the dough a lot easier to work with than before. With your bench scraper, divide into roughly 240 gram portions. Fold and shape each portion to a ball, pinching the edges into the center. Flip and pull the dough inwards using pressure to smooth out the bottom. Leave the balls to proof for four hours at room temperature, or you can leave overnight in the fridge and use it the next day. Mike Fayona of Rose Hill Sourdough and Chef Jason demonstrate our go-to dough recipe. It's super simple and gives great results every time. This dough holds the secrets to a no-need technique. Watch out for bonus tips on balling your dough too. It's the secret to round pizza. Uh, so warm water, warm we're going to start with. Yep. So we're going to do our classic pizza dough. This is actually going to be ready in four hours. So awesome. some people take, oh, doesn't dough take a long time to make? Yeah. yeah, it can. I make dough sometimes. I let it go for 72 hours. Right, like those cold ferments or long yeah. ferments. Exactly. exactly. Right. I think people get overwhelmed when people start talking about fermentation and all this stuff. Yeah, you can jump into the science if you want. Sure. I love that part of it. But for some people, they just want to be able to make dough really quick with their family, and they get overwhelmed by all the math and all the science. So we're going to strip that all away. We're just going to make easiest pizza you can make, ready in like three or four hours, and be good to go. Cool. And I think this is the gateway to better pizza dough because I think 100%. once you realize like how easy this is, yeah. now all of a sudden you're like, wait, what's this hydration or yeah, what's this absolutely. or what's that? Yeah. So I love it. All I did was add 300 grams of warm water. Yep. Uh, and to that, I'm just going to add a little bit of salt. So this is a 10 grams of salt, just like that. Cool. And on my little handy dandy uni scale here, I'm gonna measure out seven grams of active dry yeast. So we're using active dry yeast in this recipe uh, just because we're gonna make this really quickly. Yep. Um, but there's all other types of stuff you can use. You can use fresh yeast, which is really popular in Naples. Sure. Yep. Uh, I prefer sourdough. There's all kinds of stuff you can do, but the easiest, most uh, quickest way to make dough is just use active dry yeast. Active dry yeast. Yep. And it's already coming alive. There you go. So I'm just gonna give that a little bit of a whirl just to dissolve that salt and active dry yeast just a little bit. And then we're gonna be using some flour. So this flour is double O flour and it gets a name because it's really, really finely milled, really delicate flour. Yep. Um, but again, you don't need double O flour if your grocery store doesn't have it. Sure. Grab some bread flour, grab some all-purpose flour. Yep. That's how I started making pizza dough, all-purpose flour. Cool, so we're just gonna jump in 500 grams of my double O flour. All right, right on, cool. Uh, and then I'm just gonna mix, not without a, or, sorry, not without a mixer. mixer. Nope. Without on, the mixer. Without the mixer, without with the mixer. Scraper. With, with, yeah, with the scraper, with a little it. spatula, whatever you wanna call it. it. So this is super easy. This is something that you can do, uh, you know, say you wanna have uh, pizza night on a Friday sure. night, Friday morning, whip this up together and just let it sit out. Uh, I like to do it with just the, uh, the spatula here without a mixer because I think it's really quick and I like to get kind of my hands on the dough. Right. Could I double this batch? and make extra pizza dough and freeze it. So literally I could I could uh, make pizza dough once, but use it to cook two or three times. Yep, absolutely. I've, awesome. got, a, I've got a friend who just had twins. Yep. Uh, she makes my pizza recipe all the time and that's exactly what she does. She whips the dough together. She'll make a double or a triple batch. She'll make the pizza she wants to make. And then yeah, absolutely. She'll, she'll ball she'll up the pizza the dough balls. and then she'll chuck those in little baggies and throw them in the freezer. So we've been, this is like, Seriously, like two and a half minutes. Yeah, it's not that much time. And we mixed it. It's mixed. Yeah, it's mixed. So literally, I'm Next just gonna. Step. Yeah, I'm just gonna cover this with the. With, and it's not gonna look like really sure, dough yeah. right now. It's just kind of. Oh, it's kind of just a mixture. That's fine. Yeah. We're gonna let science and nature do its thing. I'm gonna cover that up with the towel. I'm just gonna let that sit. How long do we let that sit? Uh, anywhere from like 15 minutes to an hour, really. Uh, this is stuff that we mixed up okay. uh, about an hour ago. And what you're gonna do is you take it out of the bowl, and you're just gonna kind of give it a good stretch like this. Yep. Now. A couple things you can do from here, because I said, remember, we're gonna let it sit for like three or four yeah, hours. Yeah, and that's gonna be the the rising part, right? Or yeah, the bench the, proofing the or whatever they call it. Sure. Yeah, so sure. bulk, that's what we're gonna do. So I'm just gonna take that, I'm just gonna throw that on my bench, whether it's a countertop or whatever it is. If you don't have a lot of space, you can throw it back in the bowl, uh, and we're just gonna cover that back up. Yeah. And there you go, you're gonna let that sit for, again, three to four hours. Um, till it's done. Till it's done. Right. Say, you, say you're like, you, you go to make this dough, and you're actually making it for tomorrow because you found town the day before, yeah. Do this exact same step, just throw it into a container and toss in the fridge. So now after four hours? Yeah, it's gonna look something like this. 
and it smells incredible. You oh, it's like you can smell that yeast coming alive, Absolutely. like doing exactly what we want it to do. And now this is the hard part, right? Super hard, because you have to like oh, measure and all that. No. So I'm taking my pizza dough here. Our recipe uh, from Rooney.com makes four really good sized pizza doughs. Okay. Uh, so I'm basically just gonna break this up into four pieces. If you've got a bench scraper, you can do it with a bench sure. scraper. Um, literally, you can just do it with your hands if you've got it. There right. you go. So half and half. So Give me one four. of those guys yeah, too. Come on over here. Myself a little flour. So this is the balling technique here. Yep. So literally all we're just gonna do is we're just gonna uh, we've got a smooth side on the top and yep. our seam side on the bottom, so we're just going to keep that the same. We're just going to press the dough from the top, smooth it out, and press it up into the bottom, so keeping that smooth side really smooth and making our seam on the bottom. And then we're just going to use the edges of our hands to seal that dough up on the bottom. You can use the bench, you can do a little rolling technique, whatever you want. To get a round pizza, you got to start with a round dough ball. Hand stretching can leave a lot of people scared, but it's great fun, and you get a beautiful puffy crust. Josh Tahan of True Craft Barbecue will help you ditch the rolling pin if you follow his technique. I'm gonna show you how to stretch dough so that you can toss it easily. Here we go. Take your dough ball, put it on a nicely floured surface, get some flour on top, all right. We're gonna push down the middle. We're gonna start stretching it. We wanna get all of the air from the center all the way to the sides. Here, it's on the back of my knuckles. I'm just sitting here, letting gravity do most of the work while I spin. I'm doing this just to continue the stretch. You can see how gravity is already starting to pull. I'm gonna put it back down now. Take my two hands, one's gonna hold the dough. This hand right here, this right hand's gonna stretch it, spin it, stretch it, stretch it. You do this a few times, and then it's time to really let gravity do the work. Back on the knuckles again, a little shake to get it down, all right. So now you have a really, really nicely stretched pizza. Here's what you wanna do. Use the back of your knuckles. Hold it like that, and when you wanna toss your dough, you want to push up and then push your fingers up and let the dough fly like this. Whoops, all right. And then one more. And you can see here how lovely that dough is stretching. So there you have it, our top tips for perfect pizza dough. For more pizza content, search for UniHQ on YouTube. And don't forget to share your creations with us on Instagram. Yeah.